Beatrice. Um, uh, I met her aunt at a number of events here in Seattle um, and uh, saw Alex, their CEO, present at an event. And uh, it seemed like they were working on some uh, very cool and interesting things. Um, and as Arches, I don't know if you guys were here earlier when he said that, you know, he's going to talk about stuff that nobody else is really dealing with. Um, so with that, uh, I'm going to hand it to Arches. Thank you, Arches, for doing this. Hey, thank you. Thank you, Hans, for um, inviting me. And thanks, everyone else, for joining. Um, this is, I promise it's going to be fun. Um, so I'm, I'm just going to get started, and we can get through the presentation part super quickly. And then we can have more fun with uh, questions, comments, criticisms. Every, everything is fair game. Um, <clears throat> so I want to talk about cybersecurity for IoT specifically. and. Um, and ignore the punchline of stop attacks before they start. Um, so today's agenda is I promise uh, that there is no product solution or service pitch. And when I when I say that, there's not even like a, a hidden product solution service pitch. I'm actually going to focus on problems for which uh, no one actually has an answer today. Um, these are problems that people are worrying about in the lab. Uh, research papers are coming out, but no one really knows how how we're going to deal with them. And so I, I've been very excited to um, get the demos ready and, and show you how some of these attacks work. Um, the PowerPoint part of this is going to be very short. Um, ask me questions if, if something's unclear. And um, anyway, so I'm gonna, I'm gonna talk about the most significant threat for IoT. Um, and I'm going to show some data that shows uh, you know, by numbers and by damage why this is the significant threat. Um, and then I'm actually going to walk through like how does a real attack work uh, of this type? Um, I'm going to kind of show you a demo, a couple of demos. And then I'm going to, the number five is how we are, how are we remedying it? The answer is we really aren't. Um, and so I want to kind of just leave it at that and point out, you know, the things we're all thinking about and trying, but um, there's no real viable answer that I know of. Uh, who, who am I? I'm the CTO at Polyverse. My background is in large scale service operations, so like large fleets of servers. Um, and, you know, not particularly applicable to IoT in my, in my past, but um, I am very empathetic uh, to usable, practical, measurable security because I'm not a security person. Um, I'm not an infosec person. I don't have a CISSP, right? So basically, I'm not. I'm not your compliance guy, right? I'm not gonna say, oh, let you know, just use a VPN or just sign that or use crypto or whatever, right? Um, because I was the person who had to deploy all that shit, and so I really care. You know, can I deploy this? Does this thing work? Is this gonna break something for me? Um, the second important part here is I'm um, simply presenting. I don't work on most of what I'm going to talk about today. Uh, people way, way smarter than me um, do the real work. They're the people who came up with their demos. Um, and you'll actually see why You know, some of the demos are just really, really crazy and insane. Um, and we actually have, uh, we are one of the few companies that hires uh, compiler experts we exclusively hire compiler geniuses, um, and they and we have a large team of them. If you're ever interested in working in compilers, if you are working in compilers, looking to solve the problem I'm going to talk about, um, reach out to us. Reach out to me. Um, and so, with that said, um, the cybersecurity problem of today, and this, you know, I think what's going to be surprising is this is not the problem people talk about or think about, but the data actually shows that this is the problem that um, is increasing, right? And so um, memory safety bugs, um, you know, if, if some of your Rust fans out there, I know you're just joyously jumping right now, um, just hold that in because I agree with you. Um, memory safety bugs are the number one weakness in software just by far. And this has, this has been a problem for about 20 years. Um, and we'll go into why this this becomes a more relevant problem as more and more devices um, connect externally. 70% uh, of all security bugs are memory safety problems, safety bugs. And I'm actually going to go through some data. Um, 
this chart you see here is on our website, and there's a, there's going to be plenty of links on all my um, charts and diagrams, so you can go verify the sources yourself. Um, but always feel free to pause me and challenge me if something looks off. Um, and so we, we run this weakness report on all of Linux across multiple distributions, and obviously buffer, uh, you know, for Alpine buffer problems are like 83%. They, they vary somewhere between like 65 and 85 or sorts. So this, this was a huge headline about uh, maybe a year ago where for all of Microsoft throughout their, um, you know, their uh, Pat Tuesdays and their fixes and their, their problems, um, what they basically came up with was 70% of all their security bugs were memory safety problems. Um, and there's a source there and there's a bunch of data that correlates that, right? But we know Microsoft sucks and, you know, they don't know what they're doing, right? Everyone else knows better. And then Chrome came up with this uh, two days ago. Right, 70% of all security bugs are memory safety issues. Well, okay, maybe Microsoft and Chrome are just like one-off idiots, right? What do they know? And so then if you look at the NIST data, uh, and I'm I'm not even like collapsing all the all the various types of uh, buffer problems, literally buffer overflows is that big line, which um which was number one until uh, cross-site scripting just crossed it um early, you know, late last year. And we'll go into, you know, A, it's not applicable to IoT, but um, the other thing is um, if you actually, if you add up all the various buffer problems in these lines, you're going to find that um, that thing just literally goes through the roof. It's like a J curve going upward. Um, and so, and, and this is across like a variety of software, right? And so this is all CVEs and theoretical. These are all headlines, right? What do they know? Well, Google keeps a spreadsheet, uh, Google's Project Zero. Um, it's like a very elite secretive uh, group. They're not secretive, they're just very elite. Um, they keep uh, a list of CVEs um, that were exploited in the wild. This is like a zero day that actually got used uh, that they know of in the wild. Um, and then they track that. And this is the spreadsheet so far of 2020. And you see that eight out of 11 uh, greater than 70% are uh, memory corruptions, right? So, and, and they're all over the place, right? Uh, Internet Explorer, Firefox, Chrome, what have you. Um, so, so the problem is clearly there, right? The problem is, is obvious. Um, we, can, we can slice and dice this every way we want, um, but it just keeps on popping up, right? But here's the, here's the thing, right? We don't hear of this. Uh, when we talk to security people, no one really talks about buffer overflows or memory corruptions or memory safety, right? Um, it's all about like crypto and signing and, and elliptic curves and quantum and whatever, right? So why is that? Um, before that, I, I kind of want to like touch on um, IoT and then I'm going to go into like why we don't talk about buffer overflows. Um, so one real problem with IoT that um, that I think is obvious and we can all buy into, and it's not a problem, but it's basically like there is a safe, right? Each device is a safe and each device has a combination. The problem is um, a million devices are potentially, if you know, if everyone does their job well, about 8 billion devices are going to have the exact same combination. Uh, and this might be all the source code, the signing keys, right? Um, the device itself might have um, its own unique signing keys sometimes, but like the source is still the same. And so that's kind of a problem. And the reason it's a problem is it's obvious, right? Um, I mean, if, if we all had the same DNA, uh, whatever is happening right now would just be killing way more people than it already is killing. Um, and that's because an attacker breaks one of them and they know how to break all of them. And I'm gonna prove this with a demo very, very soon. Um, the other problem with IoT is, um, and this kind of uh, goes into the open problem that we're gonna talk about, right? Which is you can open up the device, right? We're, we're fundamentally, the difference between AWS's data center and IoT is that you have to create a device and you have to make it secure and it has to have all these USB ports and whatever it is that you want to add to it. 
and then you have to hand it off to someone and you have to hand it off to about again if you do your job right then you're going to hand it off to um you know seven or eight billion people right um and so fundamentally you you're at a disadvantage up front because everyone can just open one up and see how you what you're doing to secure it the other problem is you know security has to fit between like the cost performance size and power envelope right uh yeah we can do like the poison chips and you can do you know like the the little vials of of um of toxins that break apart when you try to tamper with the cpu but somehow that has to be you know like fit in on, on the on a device the size of a dime and then it has to be cost effective and it has to be performant and it has to be small and all that right so it's like a it's a, a bunch of very conflicting uh, priorities there so why don't we hear about buffer overflows right i mean clearly it's a problem multiple companies talk about it multiple people are working on this problem and so there's there's a there's an issue right there's fundamentally um something off about how the security world deals with this and my contention is we everyone intuitively understands how a buffer overflow works right it's like yeah you overflow a buffer and then you can do anything you want but what does that mean what does that look like right how how does that do anything useful uh, how does an attacker take advantage of that and so i'm going to show you so yeah this is what i just talked about it's like we've heard about it we're supposed to know it's bad but i don't really understand what damage it causes right like i should should i be worried about certificates and something else or should i really care about this so as we before we go into a buffer overflow i'm going to i'm going to walk you through how an attack really works and then i i'm, I'm going to show you the attack right um so fundamentally um every function in a program um uh, basically has something called a heap and a stack and and then there's a text segment where all your executable um instructions live and pretty much every architecture that i can think of right now has um has these three primary concepts and what happens is whenever uh this function foo and this is c code it's kind of pseudo c code but um whenever this function foo calls into bar what it really does is it says hey before i jump into bar i'm going to save all my registers uh you know my current state in a place so i can i can resume my execution then i'm going to create something called a stack frame i'm going to say hey bar needs some memory to run and so i'm going to allocate a, a chunk of memory that i know ahead of time it's going to need and then i'm going to um sort of go you know move my execution to the start of bar and then it's going to just use all those memory locations and the way the way they're there is um the compiler kind of just replaces these symbols with offsets from your stack frame base and that's how it works and this is a really really bad program by the way because um you can see there's bad uh, pointer arithmetic there's um like there's like an obviously stupid buffer overflow out here and then there's a use after free right like the buffer is cleared uh, is no longer is freed kind of um and then it's it's used by the it's returned to the caller so bunch of dumb things going on um oh yeah so how do you use a buffer overflow uh, to open a remote shell so let's let's have the simplified view of a buffer right uh, of a stack frame and what this is is um is you have these local variables and your buffer they just have some random values and then there's a stack canary and I'm going to talk about that in just a minute and then there's a return and what this return is is it's just saying hey you know after I'm done with bar go back to my function foo right and so and then that probably makes sense right so a function can call into functions and then once they're done they return control back and then you can call into other functions or not um and so this is this your typical stack frame um and so the canary is a is a very very uh kind of cool trick to prevent exactly what i'm going to show you uh can happen from happening um and then i'm going to show you how we beat a canary so what a, what a stack canary does is it says hey if if you overflow the buffer right 
and you overflow the buffer and you go you go right up to the return address and you just write some arbitrary value um you're going to screw up my execution right and i'm not going to know that you did something stupid so i'm going to like place a random value that has no meaning between all of my variables and my return address and you're not going to know um the well a lot of times you will know the length of that value but you know you're not going to know the actual value right i'm going to just make it up when i run the program um and so what happens is if you overflow the buffer you write some crap into the canary and then you change the return address um and what happens is it it verifies is the canary value what i thought it should have been and it's not and you say hey you tried to do something silly i don't like you very much um so how do you how do you break a canary and i i'm actually going to show you a demo of this by the way so how you break a canary is you you just keep on sending it a bunch of overflowed buffers and right after the overflow you send it a value of 0 0 right and then you make it 0 1 and 0 2 and 0 3 and and each time the canary hits you uh you know that you got that value wrong right you still don't know the rest of the values but like you know this is wrong right when the canary doesn't hit you if there is no crash if there is no rejection of your request um then you know so like i i try these oops and so in this case for instance 0 0 just work right and so now i'm going to show you like then i i go one byte ahead and i try like 0 0 0 1 and i keep on going until i try f5 and it's like oh hey that didn't crash so i know the next byte and i can keep doing this until i break the entire canary and now i can overflow my buffer i can set the canary to exactly where it was and then i can change the return address right and this is obviously dangerous because i'm going to show you why so why is that thing bad well this is what i do uh when i overflow a buffer i um at the end of bar I use this buffer variable, and in it, I I I just fill in the string called bin sh, and then I fill my canary, and then I say, hey, instead of returning to foo, go go return to exec ve, because that's where I want you to go to, and then and then here's a parameter that I set for you happily, right? And then what happens is when when controller turns into this function, that guy reads um reads this value that you just passed into it. um and then open the remote shell and i'm i'm simplifying aggressively uh, all of the source code is open and i'll i'll share links at the end um any any comments or questions is this deep enough not deep enough not clear yeah ah, someone asked is the canary always able to be broken on a per byte basis uh it seems similar to brute forcing a password um Yes, a canary is uh, in in all the canaries that we've studied so far. Um, they can be broken on a per byte basis uh, because um, because like you don't touch the rest of the canary value, so you just you just keep on probing until you break one byte at a time. So, yeah, that's you know I mean it's it's a very cool idea. Just people, it's always an arms race, right? So this is what happens and then people take control. And so what what does that mean in real life, right? I'm going to kind of show you a real demo of this ROP attack and the, uh, ROP basically stands for return oriented programming. And just to give you a recap of of what that means, um when you write code on the stack, the stack is not executable, right? So if you overflowed the buffer and if you injected a bunch of um you know binary code in there it's not going to run because um the pages might be marked as non executable uh you have the dep on right um data execution prevention and so what you do is instead of instead of like going into you know trying to inject code you set up the stack frames in a chain called a rop chain such that the return addresses um can can compose a full program um to do whatever it is you wanted to do right because you can return to arbitrary functions all over and then you can just kind of create your own virtual program by reusing uh sections that are already executable 
uh, throughout the original program. And that's kind of like a very, very scary attack. Oops, so we're gonna, we're gonna exit this and I'm gonna show you a demo. And this is, this is demo number one and it's kind of very simple. And what I'm gonna do is, um, it used to need three windows, but now it needs two terminals. Um, so I'm gonna open a reverse listener and this is, this is kind of my attacker machine. Uh, consider this my command and control machine. And there's nothing, you know, it's netcat, right? Doesn't know anything better. Now out here, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna run a vulnerable program and all of the source code is open so you know, um, God damn it. Kill my old containers. Yeah, I need that. So I'm, I run a container, and now on the same machine, I'm actually going to open up Netcat. And what I've done here is, um, is this is um, so we're actually running standard nginx in that container. And don't worry about the containers. This this whole thing doesn't rely on like cloud native and Kubernetes and whatnot. It's we just use Docker as a as a very good packaging mechanism. Um, and so it's an echo server, or supposedly it's an echo server, right? Uh, but it's actually a an echo server with a backdoor that we've injected, and um, and you can run that um, that program through all the static analysis and dynamic analysis and whatever tools you want, and that backdoor doesn't get detected. That's you know because it's just an overflow, right? There's nothing there. Um, it's a simple logic bug. Now what I'm going to do is I'm actually going to um, in that back door we actually have a script which um, is able to when I give it that it actually tells me how to overflow a buffer and what it's done is it's walked its own memory and it said you know I can tell you on this host uh, where all my uh, you know where the C library is where um, where all the memory locations for libraries are and then it's saying hey if you give it this string. Um, this thing will give you a, re a reverse shell. And we're not gonna like um, unhash that string right now because once again, it's all documented and it's all very obvious. Um, and so now if I actually give it that string, and so this is happening remotely, right? The container is running entirely separate from what I'm doing remotely. And I just asked it to give me info and I run that. And what just happened, is super funny. On this end, nothing particularly happened. Nothing's really wrong. But here, I'm actually reading. Um, you know, I'm I'm actually rooted in remotely. I have a reverse shell from that container that talks to um, this reverse listener that I opened up. Is this making sense? Is this useful? Yes. Okay, perfect. So, so yeah. So basically, what what I just showed is like imagine this is your device, right? This device is somewhere on the internet. You can ping it. You can you can kind of talk to it, and you know that there is a buffer overflow somewhere in its SSL library or networking library or wherever. It doesn't matter where it is. Uh, so long as it's there, uh, you can just basically like I can just open a reverse shell. Right? And, I, and and it can't be detected. There's no malware. There's nothing wrong with it, right? If, if that's coming across. It's just a simple unbounded um, buffer. It's kind of silly. And you can actually perform this magic trick yourself. So um, all of this code is open. Um, I, I'll, I'll share the slides after. And here's the link at the end. And you can just go to the Polyverse blog and look for it, and you'll find it as well. And you can you can do this party trick all the time. So how do we you know I mean this is not a new problem right? So how do we solve this problem today? Well, we we use ASLR, 
uh, obviously. And uh, the, the demo I just showed you actually breaks ASLR, but it, it again, there is a good attempt when it came out. It was important. Um, we have compile time polymorphism, which is what Polyverse does, my company. But don't worry, because we're just setting the stage, right? Polymorphism does not fix what I'm going to talk about after. Um, and so we, we do this for, um, for our purposes. Uh, then you can do some runtime scrambling, which is fine-grained ASLR. Uh, the Linux kernel actually just got a patch set about, I want to say, five days ago, which is going to allow it to boot uh, with all the functions reordered at each boot time. And so that's going to help, right? And, and why all of these essentially boil down to this diagram. And I'm really bad at drawing with my touchpad, but you know, instead of like the original return to uh, from uh, bar to foo, you used to return from bar to exec ve. And by moving exec ve every single time, you can you just jump to an invalid return address, and then you know you fail, and the the defender catches this problem, right? And so in theory, this works on servers. This works on desktop. This works. This is awesome, right? We've solved the problem. Well, not really. <laughs> so I'm now going to talk about the problem um, with no solutions. And there's a couple of companies I can name who are openly worried about this. There's a bunch that I can't name who are very, very seriously worried about this. Um, and I can assure you that they all make uh, devices that we all run in our homes. Um, and so the problem is thus, right? Um, what I just showed you, we can do this, right? We can do this, and you can you can scramble stuff around. Um, but what happens if I don't have the detection, right? I don't control the server. It's not on my data center. It's not in my server farm. It's millions of devices that are just running all over the planet. Uh, some of them might not be connected to me. I can't look at logs. I can't do anything, right? And so. Um, what that means is that an attacker can literally do one of, well, they can do one of two things, right? The first is really, really stupid and really, really effective, which is called a blind drop. And what a blind drop does is, in this case, there's an invalid return address, right? And that's fine, right? All I do is I just keep on attacking the damn thing byte by byte. And if I can run like 100 attacks a second, you know, I just keep this thing running for about a day, and you know, I promise you, I'm gonna get through, right? So that's that's like one obvious thing, and it's called a blind drop. It's really stupid and it's really effective, and you know, no one's around to defend a smart toaster. Attackers have all the time in the world, and that is a huge problem that people are worried about. And um, I'm gonna actually share a paper on this uh, at the end. The second problem is, is far, far worse, and it affects more than just IoT devices. Um, this one actually affects uh, cell phones more than, more than what you might consider uh, the super small devices like smart fridges. And what a JIT drop does is it can read the memory layout at runtime, and it can construct an attack. And I showed you a little taste of that when, when um, the little demo I showed was able to construct um, an attack on the fly and give it back to me. Um, but now where does matter, right? Uh, mobile apps. Mobile apps can read everything, right? They're installed. They have all the time in the world to read your, um, your OS. Well, maybe you can protect your OS. Maybe you can protect your kernel. But your C library is linked in. I mean, you, can't, you can't keep them from reading the C library. They have to be able to call into the thing to use it. Uh, your APIs, they have to be able to call into it. Um, the other the other big uh, attack vector, the definitive paper on JITROP is about uh, JavaScript, where you can just have like a client-side program that constructs a ROP attack uh, and is able to read browser memory and then break out, right? Um, and then obviously multi-tenant containers and VMs um, on server scenarios. The, the other big fun part of this is, um, and I'm not, I'm not going to pick on Intel, I promise, but um, the, the, a, a big definitive paper on JITROP also came from the um, 
on, from the secure enclaves that um, that are built into processors. And and this was kind of silly when you think about it. Um, the assumption was that insecure enclave programs, like outside of the enclave, would really, really care about reading the enclave, right? Because everything in the enclave is super important and super valuable. And so we have to prevent everyone from the outside to reading in. But no one worried about um, was, uh, you know, a, a malware that actually goes into the enclave and then starts reading the rest of memory. And it was never considered that, um, you know, and uh, the malware could just try and go in the enclave on your behalf and then just go access everything. And so it's kind of a, a very simple oversight in, in retrospect, but just super funny. Um, we have a question. Do you need to log into an IoT device first to uh, launch the robot attack? Um, you don't. The, the thing is you must have some interaction uh, with the device. So if, if your HTTP, if your network termination libraries have an overflow, you don't need to log in. And I'm actually going to show you that demo too. Um, if you, like, you know, the, 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 the farther in you can get, the better. Hold on, I'm going to close my window here. Neighbors chose to mow the lawn right about now. Um, yeah, and so, uh, OK, I think I answered the question. Perfect. So I'm going to show you a real demo of a blind just-in-time rock attack. And this is my favorite demo. This took a lot of work by a lot of very, very smart people. And we will not go into it. Now, um, first of all, yeah, I'm ignore this part. Um, so OK, so I'm actually, everything runs in Docker. I'm going to run this uh, Nginx image, which is a real Nginx. It's unpatched. Uh, this demo is not open source, and I will tell you why it's not open source in a bit. Um, it's just for more legal reasons than one. But if you if you actually want to touch it and feel it and play with it, uh, send me an email uh, under NDA. We can we can show you the demo. We can show you how it works and why it works and why it's so dangerous. So I'm running an engine an engine X that we locked before it was um, before it was patched, and we we do this a bunch. Um, it it's just a big part of life for us is to like take snapshots of various popular um, products over time because uh, once they get patched, we we found it almost impossible to find an unpatched copy because patches get backported. So I'm running an engine X. And here, I'm going to run the blind drop. And you're going to see what it does. And it's super fun. So this thing is what it's doing. And I'm, you know, it's going faster than I can talk through it. But it is now probing Nginx. And I actually told it um, to look for a buffer overflow. So what it did was it, it checked for a vulnerability. It found that there was a buffer that was not, that was not checked. And then it kept on probing, and it broke the stack canary in 108 uh, uh, bytes, I think, right? Because the because, uh, stack moves upward. Um, and so now what it started to do was it then started searching for the PLT. And I'll get into what the PLT is. But um, it's, the, it's the procedure link table. Oops, my bad. I broke it. That's supposed to be more impressive than I showed it to be. Oops, and there it is. So on the Nginx side, you can actually see that it's stack smashing. So it's crashing, but because a web server is designed to have multiple processes and never cut connectivity, uh, it just has an infinite amount of opportunity to keep on breaking. And so what this thing is doing is there's something called a procedure uh, link table which uh, is how Nginx is able to say, hey, you know, when I start, I'm going to need these 50 uh, calls from the C library, right? And that might be malloc or read or uh, fwrite or whatever it is. And so it says, these are the calls that I'm exposing to you. I don't know where they are right now. And then the loader, uh, when it loads Nginx, it then goes out and picks up libc. And then it, it attaches them, right? So it, it hooks them together. And so what this program did 
was it found an overflow way the hell up here. It broke the stack canary. Then it kept on walking using the same stack canary method. It kept on like trying to inject bytes uh, until um, you know until it crashed or it didn't crash really. So when it doesn't crash, it knows that it got the byte correct, right? And then it actually figured out the entire um, procedure link table. And so now these are all the calls that it can construct a op chain on. You know, everything from like within OpenSSL to libc to whatever it is that, that it wants to use, right? And then what it's doing is it is, um, it is then setting some environment variables. So it's now, because it's just free to do what it wants, it's going out and mallocking a bunch of things that it likes. Uh, and it's setting a bunch of values that it wants. And then it constructs a ROP chain uh, that then composes these functions into a way that it prefers. And then it says, I'm pwned, right? And so you'll notice that now, here's the thing, it can't break out of, um, out of your sort of UID, right? Uh, because it broke into Nginx, it's running as www data user 33, but I can still I still have a reverse shell, and this is entirely remote, right? So for a while, um, this Nginx actually existed out in the world, out on the internet. Like this is real. We we haven't. This is not synthetic. We haven't created this one, um, but we just don't want this Nginx out. Like we don't want to be the people responsible. <laughs> from whom someone got this and maybe installed it somewhere. So we keep this very close to our chest. And this program did uh, two things, right? It did a blind drop where it just acted like an, like an idiot and it just kept on brute forcing its way until it figured out the canary and the PLT table. And then it went into JIT drop mode and it said, hey, what do I, what do I have to play with? And I'm gonna use whatever I have to play with and then I'm going to use those and compose those into a program that I like. And then I'm going to open a reverse shell uh, through the web server. And that is the, the problem. This is the problem that, um, that everyone is concerned about. Um, and I'll, I'll kind of show you. Uh, there, is, there is proof that people are concerned about this. So it's not just us. Um, I'm happy to tell you that I don't. I know of zero solutions to this as of today. Uh, if this exists anywhere out in the world, I I can't tell you credibly that there is an easy way to stop it uh, or prevent it. Um, but we'll get into that in just a minute. Um, while this has been running, um, there is something we created called a uh, called Polytech. It's open source. It's a detector that looks for symptoms of a of a blind drop or a jit drop attack because um, they would tend to be these brute force stupid attacks. And so a conventional uh, SIM tools and monitoring tools don't look for them. Uh, so we're kind of open sourcing this agent that looks for them. And then the attack I just ran will show up as a blip um, on, the, on this little graph that, I'm, that we're hosting. And so that is the the problem of the day and basically every device that is out there given enough time and given one buffer overflow is going to be vulnerable um, to just reading the entire device memory and then taking over so are we dealing with this right um, and i promised there are stations in the audience uh, you know, the, the obvious thing to do is to prevent overflows, right? And so using memory safe languages and, you know, uh, Mozilla was credibly ahead of its time. I mean, they started worrying about this in 2012. Um, and, you know, and then Chrome obviously came out with their report like three days ago. So Mozilla has been worried about this the long, not the longest, but at least in public. Uh, Apple came up with Swift to solve the same problem. And then, of course, Microsoft is is currently building something called Check C that um, they're promoting. They're trying to work on heavily for um, Azure IoT. Um, so that's how you prevent the problem, right? The problem is you can't, you can't, right? I mean, Rust has had its share, its fair share of buffer overflows um, of its own because it's a systems language. Can't do anything about it. Um, so then. We have to deal with the problem, right? 
And the, the contemporary way of dealing with the problem is systems that are always moving. Uh, MIT had a had a famous or in, you know it, it's a it's a fairly well known in the security um, realm project called uh, uh, Tracer, and what this thing does is it at runtime it's able to introspect your program and move things around and whatnot. Um, it's pretty cool, you know. But like in IoT, remember the constraints. You don't have. I mean, you don't have like virtualized processors and and you know like massive amounts of memory and and recompile you know recompilation uh, time and space uh, to pull off something like that. Um, the uh, DARPA just funded a chip that's called the Morpheus chip. That's you know someday in the future when you write programs for the chip and recompile them is going to you know keep all of this memory moving right and i have no doubt that it'll happen but like does this solve the problem as it exists on our cell phones iot devices not really and the reality is we don't have a practical answer available today right um, and and what i mean by practical is like you know not works on my machine but like if you if you came to me or if you went to anyone and you said hey I'm going to build like the next Alexa, or I'm going to build these these very very smart toasters, um, and go solve this for me. And people will be like, yeah, you know, like yeah, we can we can do this and we can do that, and you know, throw a lot of terminology at you. But can they basically start at state A and say, here's the problem, and then state B where it's no longer a problem? Not really. Um, and so yeah, and so one it's one of the things that. Polyverse is working on, and I know a bunch of other people are as well. And so that's the end of, and here's the papers, and you can Google them, and you can, you know, I can share the slides at the end. Um, oops, my bad, my bad. Oh, there we go. Sorry about that. Um, and that's that's it. Any questions or comments or? I have one. So yeah. how far do you think we are from actually solving this? Obviously, if it's not solved in the server land yet, uh, I assume IoT is even further out. Um, yeah, I, you know, the the answer is, uh, I mean, the, the joke within Polyverse is it's like a cord fusion. It's always two years away. <laughs> um, but uh, you know, I mean, we're working on it aggressively. We're trying. Um, we think we'll have something soon, but um, it's a trade-off, right? And I think, like, it. Uh, I think the best credible approach that I can think of would be um, something like what Apple is able to do, and something that Azure IoT is now like aggressively going after, which is you have to control the stack. For this to be done in user space, you need to have some kernel features. And for that kernel, you need to have some processor features. Um, and so it, it's going to have to be some ensemble solution. Mm. Looks like there's a couple more questions. Yep. Dan and Cody. Dan, okay. you, wanna, you can unmute and ask the question if you want. Cody, same thing. Oh, can you hear me? Yeah. Yeah. So thank you, uh, Arches. This is great. Um, I was very impressed that you got to the roots so fast. <laughs> uh, my question is probably not related to this, this but more at a uh, high level. Um, IoT is weak on security, and blockchain is uh, great on security. Do you see uh, if we combine these two technologies uh, in the future that we could solve uh, some uh, security uh, issues? It's more strategic um, type of thing. Yeah, I, you know, I think I think we can some um, not not the issues that I talked about as you rightly pointed out. Um, I think blockchain is really really good for. Um, for consensus-based trust, right? If I have something to lose and you have something to lose, like we both have a smart fridge, we can spy on us. Uh, we both have an incentive to, to play together to prevent that, mm -hmm. right? Um, and that's 
that's helpful, right? So like with the with for instance the stack smashing uh, logs that you saw, right? It would be very cool if um, there is a blockchain where people are able to like share their stacks, um, you know, like stack smashing log fi uh, log files, and then able to say, hey, I saw like these fifty uh, attempts, and mm. did you also see those fifty attempts? Wow, well, that's that must be an attack. Mm. Yeah. And then yeah, it seemed to me um, we are still at the early beginning of uh, IoT adoption, and uh, and the IoT devices definitely need to be uh, monitored, just like um, all of the servers in data centers. And maybe that uh, we could use uh, AI, machine learning, or kind of fancy analytic yeah. uh, tool to detect the yeah, abnormality. Right. Uh, for instance, when you started to attack, there's a pattern. I just saw your curve; it jumped up, right? And I will try to do something to counter attack it. Uh, so, leaving IoT devices out in the open is a bad idea. I think that in the future, maybe the IoT devices, videos of the IoT devices, they all need to be monitored, just like the guys working in data centers. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I agree with you. Yeah, thank you. Thanks, Dan. Yeah, Cody, do you wanna? Sure. Uh, yeah, thank you for the talk. That was great. I'm pretty new to the security aspect, but I have a lot of, uh, I don't know if I should say I have some of these devices in my house. So um, I'm kind of wondering in general too, because uh, I like to do some of my own, um, you know, development, ESP8266 and stuff like that. And, you know, just get into it. But the thing I was wondering is like, are most of these devices running Linux then? I've also like heard some podcasts where people talk about, you know, when they go to production, they actually really reduce the operating system down to just the like the core functionality that the device needs. And like, yeah. are these, are these kind of like also, you know, is it, can you just run the same thing on all these devices? And um, yeah. That was, that was like my first question. My follow-up was <clears throat> the demo was really cool. So I was wondering if there's a way, you know, like uh, when you're, when you're running this code to be able to just see, you know, all the, I guess like the namespace, all the functions that you might have access to after you run a buffer overflow. Yeah. Um, okay. Perfect. So to, the, to your first question, um, this is a, this is an artifact of the von Neumann architecture. Right. It, um, so it has nothing to do with the OS itself. Uh, it has to do with how stacks and heaps and executable pages and non-executable pages work. And so, and the the kernel itself is just any other program, right? There's no. So you can you can have a unikernel, something that literally boots at at address zero, and has no kernel, but just one solid program. That's your entire IoT thingy. Um, and it would still be susceptible to the same attack. Um, and so the, the only way to do it is to have a proper bounds checking and you know just very clean code. Uh, to answer your second question, um, it's less language dependent. Uh, just to recap the question for everyone, it's like if you if you overflow a buffer, can you read uh, all the functions? Um, in scripting languages, yes. For that, we actually have a product, and I can I can do a whole session on that. But uh, what you saw was the um, was the export table or the import table. Uh, either way, right? And so these are uh, within a within a program. You don't really get to see the functions because you you can strip out the symbols. But when when you have to ship a program that then links to a different library, uh, you have to give the loader enough information to say go in that C library and go find me functions by these five names and tell me where they are. Um, and that's the PLT which we which we exposed. All right, any other questions? Thanks, Cody. Oh, I, I do have a couple more if that's all right, or at least just yeah, this yeah, one. Sure. Go um, what about like, I guess it's just really interesting to me to to think that like someone could send like a hundred requests to my you know IoT device and uh, be able to you know brute force a canary or something like that. Um, I guess with the 
like I just don't know how these companies work in general. So I kind of wondering on on two different ends. Like one of them is if a company is uh, <clears throat> actually monitoring these devices, you know, like someone in some security operations center somewhere is be like, hey, there's like way too many requests going to this device mm -hmm. that we know is only supposed to like open the garage door once a day or something like that. Mm -hmm. And another one is then like, what about local control? Like if I just have this device sitting on my network, maybe the vulnerabilities are still there, but at least like someone has to break into my network to be able to access it. Or like, I guess if you want it to be internet of things, then um, is it really that easy to, to jump onto that kind of connection mechanism to, to find the device and exploit it? Um, yeah, so, so, so where, you're, where you're going is absolutely, um, both the right place to go, as well as where uh, the common security researcher mind goes to, right? And uh, I call that protecting the inputs versus protecting the pipes, right? What you're basically saying is, you know, once once you put um, gasoline in my pipe, my pipe is going to burst. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to have all the inputs constantly tested, and you only put water, and only water, and nothing else, right? And I will defend these inputs with my life. Um, now, 20 years of experience has shown us that the most resilient systems are where you protect the pipes and not the inputs. Uh, that being said, I'm not saying that you should not protect the inputs. Right? You should absolutely keep it as tight as possible, keep it to your local network, keep it within a proximity. All of that is absolutely valid, but, um, but uh, you know, I mean, I mean, if you really think about it, the the things worth attacking are, you know, are people will find a way. Looks like we have another question. Uh, mm -hmm. Nisha, do you want to ask it? Yeah, and can you guys hear me? Hope you can yes, hear me. Yes. Yeah, <clears throat> maybe I, I connected a bit late, but uh, those seem like generic security issues in general, like any service that has something open that you can communicate with it. I mean, can have buffer overruns and all this. Like, what makes this unique to like, what makes it easier, I guess, to exploit on IoT devices? Um, uh, so three, three particular factors. Um, one is uh, breadth. Right, which is like you have a billion devices or eight billion devices where you can do statistical analysis. Right, like there's only so many values of a stack canary that you can have uh, before you run out of uh, cardinality. For instance, right, uh, you have opportunity. You can you can just buy a bunch of these for cheap. Right, so like when when Meltdown came out and you wanted to know like does this work on a 64 core Xeon? that AWS is using. You either had to like go book the machine or you had to go buy a damn machine not available at a Best Buy. But for IoT, like I can buy a thousand of these for cheap and do that. The second problem is um, is the, the device's own constraints. So like on a server, you can have self-modifying code, right? There's enough processing power to, to pull that stunt off. But in IoT, um, what would be a defense on the server may not be a viable defense um, in, a, in a very small uh, profile. And so people kind of cut down on things like bounce checking or, you know, like you're not going to run Java. I'm sure there's someone running Java. And the funny thing is Java was built for IoT, but, you know, like you're trying to, you're going to try and run native code, right? And so you're going to have like a, a larger um, mistake area. And then, and then the third one is just uh, the repeatability of uh, of what um, you know. I think Cody asked, which is um, you know, on a server, I can shut you off. Right? I can basically say, hey, you know what? You're you're just being stupid. I'm not taking requests from you anymore. Go to hell, right? But like my toaster, I'm not capable of doing that. And so it means I have a long period of time to to run these tests, and that that's really where it comes down. Mm -hmm. I got you. Yeah, thanks so much. Yeah. Go for it, Cody. Looks like you have another question. Yeah. Um, you know, I was just wondering about the 
polyverse is like product and stuff um and and really about this specific thing you talked a little about which is what is the i guess what is the utility of having uh mm. an understanding of like what an object will uh what it dynamic objects like polymorphism what the type will be uh before it's uh in runtime so during compile yeah. time so yeah there are different different uses of the word polymorphism um uh, object oriented programming polymorphism is about types and uh but not um uh, polymorphic programs are think more in terms of like uh you ever heard of like polymorphic viruses which modify their own code uh so that an antivirus doesn't detect their signature uh and so we do that for your operating system where we will replace sets of machine instructions with exactly the same functionally equivalent sets of machine code, uh, but it uses different instruction pairs, uh, uses different registers, different memory locations. And so if you're trying to do a JIT drop, you're looking for something specific, uh, we tend to confuse you uh, aggressively. That That's so a different type of polymorphism. All right, we're uh, right at five o'clock. Um, any one last question? Otherwise, we can call it a day. Cool. All right, thank you very much. Thanks, Arches. This was awesome and scary. Uh, hopefully, <laughs> someone will figure out a solution to this. But yeah, yeah you're welcome back uh, as you go through this and uh, um, share whatever you're learning. And hopefully the community can get involved as well. Perfect. Yeah. And reach out to me anytime you have my email. Yep. Thank you, guys. Have a good evening. Perfect. Bye. Bye.